This is a video about more about Lipschitz functions. In the beginning, we'll introduce what is a Lipschitz function for um, a single variable, single real variable, and we'll try to develop some intuition about how to think about it. And then we'll generalize it to Lipschitz functions for multivariable uh, functions in like Rn, say. And then what we'll try to do toward the end is give kind of an intuitive idea about why are Lipschitz functions desirable in say machine learning. So. Our definition, let's say A is a subset of the real line and F is a function from A to the real line. So we're gonna say F is Lipschitz on A if the following happens. There exists some constant K. I say K is a real number here. I really should say K is a positive real number, uh, such that though, for any two points X and Y that are in A, we have the distance from F of X to F of Y should be less than or equal to K times the distance from X to Y. So remember, on the real line, we can take the absolute value of the difference between two numbers to be the distance uh, between the real numbers there. Now, uh, some things to point out. That single, I told you about k first, and that k has to work for any pair of points x and y uh, that is in A. So that is important. And uh, what else can we do? We can rearrange that equation in red. Or really, that's really an inequality, isn't it? To say... That uh, if I divide through by absolute value of x minus y, assuming x and y are not the same, um, what is that? That tries to tell me that on the left side, remember, that's the absolute value of the slope of the secant line between um, the two points um, x comma f of x and y comma f of y. And so uh, what we're saying is the slope of any secant line to f where you plug in points from A, it's always got to be between minus K and K is what this says. So Lipschitz kind of puts some condition on how sloped any of the secant lines can be um, to your graph along uh, the domain. So let's do an example like, you know, how do you roll up your sleeves and show a function's actually Lipschitz? So uh, let's say I think about sine of X and I want to show that it's Lipschitz. So let's do a little proof here. And so I've got to take, remember my A here, if you see my A here is the real line. So I should take any two points X and Y that are real numbers. And what we're gonna do is uh, use some other calculus theorems to do the heavy lifting. The mean value theorem is arguably the most important theorem in calculus. Some people would probably say the fundamental theorem in calculus is. I'm not sure where I land on that. Anyway, the mean value theorem tells me that there exists a C between X and Y such that f of x minus f of y divided by x minus y uh, is equal to f prime at c. And so in other words, like the average rate of change in my function from x to y is exactly equal to the instantaneous rate of change at some point, is what the mean value theorem is trying to say. And so what we're going to do is we're going to plug in uh, our information here. So sine is my f, and so f prime would be cosine. And now what we'll do is we'll rearrange that a little bit and take the absolute value. So the first thing I say to do here is to take the absolute value and rearrange. And by rearrange, I'm going to just move this denominator over to that side. And you see that I've done that. And now what we're going to do is we're going to think about what do I know about the absolute value of cosine of C? In other words, like what's the biggest that it could possibly be? And you think about the graph of cosine. Well, it never gets any taller than one and it never gets any lower than negative one. So absolute value cosine of C uh, is definitely at most one. What we're gonna do is just substitute that into our inequality above. And so what we get, we get sine of x minus sine of y in absolute value, that's f of x minus f of y, is less than or equal to one times absolute value of x minus y. So here my k is one. So k equals one works for any x and y here. So that proves that sine is Lipschitz. You could say that uh, that um, it's, it's one Lipschitz. So sometimes people use the K that works to describe um, what class of Lipschitz functions that it is. Probably won't go too into detail with that in this video. So that's kind of a crash course in real valued uh, Lipschitz functions of a single real variable. What we're gonna do is just generalize this idea to functions in higher dimensions. We'll stick to Rn though. You could do this for any metric space though. You should go check out the topology videos I have if you wanna learn about metric spaces. Um, so let's say now that A is a subset of Rn, so just n-dimensional Euclidean space. And let's say F is a function from A to Rm, where Rm is m-dimensional Euclidean space. And remember too that like when you've got a uh, multivariable, you know, vector-valued function like this, you could still think that um, you know F is really itself uh, a function that has its components or functions. So there's like functions F1 through Fm that are real-valued functions, and I'm going to refer to those pretty soon. Anyway, though, we're going to say that F is Lipschitz on A if 
And uh, the following should happen. Sorry, I gotta get rid of these. There exists a constant k that's positive, that looks familiar, such that if I take any two vectors, x and y and a, so that's supposed to be my uh, attempt at a hat on an x just to indicate it's a vector. And so I tell you below there too, the coordinates of x are x1 through xn, and the coordinates of y are y1 through yn. Uh, we should have the following. So on the left side of this inequality here, what is that? So that's the square root of the uh, sum of the difference of squares of fi of x minus fi of y. And so this is just supposed to be like the distance function, right, for like n, uh, in this case, m variables here. And again, notice here that, you know, I'm thinking about the components fi of my function f. And what is this less than or equal to? Well, it should be less than or equal to k times uh, the, the distance from just the vector x to the vector y. And so what do I do? How do you take distances in, in Rn? Well, I know I take the difference in the components. I know that I square them. I know that I add them up. And at the end of the day, I take the square root. So again, just kind of the distance function that we all know and love if we've taken some math classes before you watch this video. And so just to uh, recap that a little bit, again, on the left side, I'm just trying to tell you about the Euclidean distance from the point or the vector fx to the vector fy. And again, I'm using the components of the function f to do that. And I'm saying that that is at most k times the Euclidean distance from x to y. So again, it's some kind of relationship between like how far the outputs are from each other is somehow related to how far the inputs are from each other. And when I say somehow related, I mean, well, like by some constant k, by some constant multiple k. So what's the catch here again? Again, that k has to work for every two vectors x and y that are in your domain. And um, so it's got to be the same k that has to work. That's not to say that there's only one k that works, but again, when we're talking about Lipschitz functions, there has to exist a single constant k that works for every x and y in your domain. Now, why are Lipschitz functions desirable in machine learning? And this goes back to the, what I just more or less said about the relationship between inputs and outputs. So if you think of the inputs as you know, the vector x and the vector y, if you think that those are close or similar, like you think that, like what are you doing machine learning for? Uh, you're doing it because you want the computer to also think that. And so it's, uh, it can make you know, good guesses on things that are obviously related to each other. And so in the case that X and Y are inputs that are similar, you want to make sure your model F also thinks so. So in other words, you want to make sure that F of X and F of Y should be close or should be similar. When I say close, you know, similar is kind of intuitive. Like, yeah, this, these two pictures are pretty much, they're, they're both apples, right? I want to tell the computer to do that. And we need to translate that into math into saying that like, well, if the distance between the inputs is small, so like two apples, when I translate that into some math and take the distance between the points that represent those, there should be a pretty small number. Um, I want to make sure that the computer thinks that as well. So it predicts that as well. So if f is Lipschitz, then I have this condition down here, this inequality that we wrote above, and just, you know, what does that say in one more way? The predicted values on the left of what the computer thinks x and y are, so remember that's f of x and f of y, that should be at least as close, so those two predictions should be at least as close to each other as, you know, k times however close x and y are. So what I hope that you buy is this little, um, um, way to interpret, I hope that you buy that this could be a way to interpret um, this inequality up here. And I'm going to try and say to you one more time, in, in maybe a slightly different way, what if you had a k, what if this k was pretty close to 1? Well, in that case, x and y would be, uh, and what if, oh, I'm sorry, that's another assumption here. So what if k is near 1, and what if you knew that x and y were pretty similar? So you've got a pretty nice function that has a Lipschitz constant of 1, say, so k is 1. Uh, then in that case, then the model F, it should always classify X as Y as being similar. So in other words, if this is one, so let's pretend that that's one, and if I know that X and Y are pretty close, then that means that this distance here is pretty small, right? Well, in that case then, if your function's Lipschitz, then that makes sure that the computer class, uh, it, it guesses that the outputs here, or it classifies X and Y as also being pretty close to each other. In other words, this distance has to be pretty small as well.